here we are with Ivar from Enslaved at Inferno Metal Festival. Uh, so how are you doing? Man? Very good, man. Looking right. forward to our show in a couple of hours. Yeah. Almost starting to get nervous, but not yet. <laughs> so do you still, after after all these years, do you get the stage fright and before yeah. the show the stress? Yeah, I do, and I, I really, I really cultivate it and encourage it within myself because uh, the moment you don't have that, then I think you you lose. A big, big part of it. Right. You get so much uh, energy, and extrasensory experience from from having that anxiety. That I, I really, yeah, I, I don't believe in trying to get rid of it at all. Okay, so it's definitely a motivating factor as well. Very much so, yeah. All right. So I mean, going back to um, Inferno, uh, you were lucky enough to perform at the first ever edition in uh, 2001. Um, so, how, how, how was that experience? If, can you recall that time? Yeah, it was, uh, it was pretty awesome. Because uh, it was the, the, like the first, we had a, a we didn't know it was going to be a festival at that time. Like we did the Hole in the Sky in Bergen the year before. Mm -hmm. where we all performed, that was more like a bunch of friends getting together. We didn't know it's going to be annual. We just thought it was going to be one-off. So then when Inferno showed up, it was actually like the first like outspoken annual Norwegian metal festival and I think one of the first real underground extreme metal festivals around actually at least in Europe uh, so it was, it was really cool to be part of that and I remember everybody enjoying being having their own festival in the country mm -hmm. people came from all over Norway and, and from other countries so it was a very special atmosphere okay awesome and if I'm correct that was also your 10th anniversary wasn't it? You were as a band as enslaved. Yes, it was. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. We started in '91, so yeah. it was after 10 years. And, and you also released uh, Money, Money Mansion. Yes. Yeah. All those things. That's right. <laughs> You've done your research, huh? <laughs> Good. I, I try to do my research before interviews. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, so how how was uh, did you did you remember anything like the reactions? Was that gig special because it was? First Inferno, ten, 10 years of Enslaved, and what you mentioned, so many things happening at one time. Yeah, I remember it was, a, it was a very positive reaction uh, because we, it was also one of the first like real headlining things that we did in the Indian Festival uh, connection. We've done, we had already done a couple of uh, mainland European ones, you know, quite down on the bail before this. At that time, Norwegian. Extreme Metal was basically known for a couple of big black metal names, you know, the guys who went to prison and Emperor and Immortal and those guys. So for us it was, it was a really big big step up. I remember that, it was very exciting, I remember that. And it gave us the confidence yeah, yeah, to, yeah. to headline and, and, and experience like that. Alright, awesome. And the next time you performed at Inferno was three years later, 2004. Uh, did you notice any differences? Did Inferno progress? Absolutely, and there was uh, a progress in the band, which is important. But but uh, when you ask about Inferno, yeah, you could see that they've been around for for just uh, three years, four years, the fourth year there, and things were so much more professional. Yeah, yeah. it was like every first, the first year. It's always like the guy with the idea mm -hmm. and his friends. And now they're already starting to have more of a professional uh, group of people around them, helping them out with things. And you could see that the, the routine was, was, was better. The people at this venue, Rockefeller, which has been part of the festival all the time, they were getting more used to working around this kind of bands yeah. and so on. So I would say that it felt like coming back to, to quite a different festival. It still had the same vibe, but it was definitely stepped up and, and being more professional. Yeah, and also that was the year when you. Uh also released another album, Isa, which is also a rather important album, wasn't it? Yeah, really important. I remember a whole week was probably one of the most important weeks in, in the Slave's career. We've just established uh, a steady lineup. These guys, which are now part of the band, except me and Jutland, those three guys, had just become uh, like regular members of the band. Because mm -hmm. we had been doing some touring and there had been session, in, session members in and out. And, and this guy, these guys had just agreed to become full-time members. Uh, we'd uh, done uh, uh, a successful few tours. 
and we actually signed with uh, Indie Recordings during the festival. Oh really? Okay. Yeah, I remember it was kind of crazy because there was this place rocking mm -hmm. across town where there was um, we were going there to have sort of a celebration of the signing yeah, yeah. with the label. They made like a cake and we were signing the cake. <laughs> nice. And there were some misunderstandings and the rumors they were all going that that we were having meetings with labels mm. at this place. Okay. And um, so it, it kind of turned out kind of weird because we went there to, to sign with the label and a bunch of other labels showed up and wanted to talk to us about signing. We we're like, we're already signed. Look at the cake. <laughs> Look at the cake. There's the proof. Yes. That's the contract. So then we're like, because at that point we were so, there were so many lineup changes and so many things going on in the band and we sort of lost track. So we were quite surprised at like, how popular Inflay was in the business. And then we did the show, it was the first time we did it with the video projections. All right. And uh, everything was, it really, for us it was a wake up call, like wow, Inflay has really gained yeah. quite a reputation. And it's getting serious now. Yes. <laughs> Uh, that, that must have been a cool feeling. Yes, yeah. it was the, the beginning of uh, like a very long uh, adventure that's still going on actually. Yeah. That's, that's how I remember it. It started with Inferno 2004 and it feels like I haven't been home since yet. Yeah. Of course I have. But... <laughs> yeah. Well, you haven't settled down. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, but that's really cool. I mean, you keep going up and especially now with the new album. You, yeah. It's like the reaction has been huge. Yeah. So, yeah. But uh, I noticed that those two albums, 2001 and 2004, Money Mansion and Esau, uh, I don't know if it's just a statistic that I noticed, uh, they are both released in November. Was there any uh, particular reason for that, or was it just because the labels preferred to release them? It's just uh, the pattern that we are we're used to work, actually, because I, I do write a lot of songwriting in the summer. Uh, when things are sort of calm down with with people going away and there's more time and I have the chance to travel uh, a little bit away from my home and so on. And so then usually when I start writing in the summer, we start working on stuff in the autumn and it takes something like a year uh, from the start of the writing process till everything's ready for recording. Uh, yeah, so that was just the basic process. This is the first time in the new album that we sort of changed that thing around. Yeah, well, you said it a couple of months earlier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, but you have not performed at Inferno since that second time in 2004, um, which is, for me at least, quite surprising since both you and Inferno since then have been progressing. How come you never come back? Was there just no... I think it was it's pretty... I'm thinking a little bit, bit about it, but my explanation is that the festival grew and the band, and we grew from being a band that could headline um, the, the early infernos, mm -hmm. you know, where, where uh, <clears throat> you don't have the biggest bands, but the inferno became big mm -hmm. and, and we also become bigger, so at some point we joined the group of bands that had, you know, that would be on the top of the building. We'd already been there two times in the early years, and there's so many bands that needed to be on top of that building, like the Had Immortal and Mayhem, Satyricon, yeah. and so on. So it, it sort of made sense. I was, I was waiting, I was waiting, anticipating it, and then one day came and said, you know, it's the 15th anniversary. It's about time to you know close that circle. It just made perfect sense, and I think it, it makes it makes it more sort of a special thing. That it's been such a long time now. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, you, you mentioned it's the 15th anniversary now. So how how important do you think Inferno has been for the Norwegian scene? Very important. It's uh, it's one of the survivors. We've not had festivals. You know, my own festival, Hold in the Sky, started the year before Inferno. We gave uh, you know we, we closed down the festival a couple of years ago. As new festivals come up, they disappeared. Inferno's been constant. Okay. They've had a good, good. Um, they have a good economical um, um, outlook on things. Mm -hmm. uh, not only in, in terms of money, but in terms of size and how you organize things. Mm -hmm. And when they expand, they seem to be doing it in terms of adding 
exciting stuff outside the festival, like the conference thing, or different clubs, or sightseeing, whatever. And I think they have really have, have that right focus. You know, in a world where people just try to be bigger and bigger, they're more looking into how they can expand the concept that they have. And you see, it's important for people to come here, the press, you know, people from the, from the industry and, and so on. And uh, yeah, I think it's together with, uh, with Roadburn in, in the Netherlands, it's probably two out of the three most important festivals for like metal that's outside the norm. Okay, which one's the third one? Yeah, I'm trying to think about that. I have a couple of candidates, but uh, it's hard to say if I, if I should think about one of the big ones, like uh, like Hellfest, which has a very mainstream program, but also has a great underground program, or if I should go with one that's strictly underground, like Beyond the Gates and Bergen, I don't know. Maybe I, I would go for Hellfest. Okay. It's just part of it. You know, Hellfest is this big, and then you have the underground part, but that underground part is extremely big, uh, yeah, important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true, that's very true. So, I mean, have, like you said, like Inferno to manage to, uh, to focus not only you know, to increase money wise and size wise, but, uh, but has it received like criticism of, you know, not being true enough or anything like that that you noticed? No, I haven't really noticed that. Not, not outside the, the normal, no, it's uh, everything will get criticized for something. Yeah. <laughs> It's uh, you know if you if you burn a church you criticize for burning the wrong church. You know? <laughs> it's uh, it's just inherent and it's the metal scene and in particular the extreme metal scene and in particular particular the black metal scene because it's so much based on it's such a it's such a powerful sort of imagery that when people feel an ownership to it they start having their own like wacky ideas and. And how it should be, uh, you know. I, I, I couldn't care less, and I think uh, in front of doesn't either. Yeah, that's good. Uh, so, I mean, are you here for the whole duration of the fest, or just today? Just today. Just today. Tomorrow is my uh, my youngest kid. She has her first first birthday. Oh, congratulations! Thanks. Happy birthday. <laughs> and I've been away for a month in the US already. And yeah. I want to be there, and uh, I don't know what she want to do. She oh. probably wants to just. Throw things on the floor. And at, le at least she can throw the things with you being there, which is exactly. important. <laughs> I can build stuff so she can <laughs> knock it over. Well, you could give her matches and she'd burn it. Yes. Like you're burning a church. I can give her a little church to <laughs> practice on. <laughs> so, I mean, um, in this digital age we live in, you know, with downloads, Spotify, and all that, how do you think fe festivals like this and concerts in general have become more important? Yeah, def def definitely. Yeah. It's become so much more like the, the, the fans uh, that are actually dedicated to, to, to what they're listening to uh, are now finding this as an outlet. I think things have a you know, weird way of balancing itself out. And I think in, in, uh, in every commercial market, uh, things will always gravitate towards the consumer. So when the labels in the 90s went too far in making shitty prod CD products, you know, spending less and less money on the, on the, the wrapping, yeah, yeah, yeah. just like a two-side booklet yeah. and selling it for 20 pounds, then of course the consumers went like, fuck you, and they went to piracy, yeah. and then the artist has to go and say, hey guys, we can't survive, we have to go back to our work, and then the consumer goes like, okay, maybe we can find a middle solution, so now we have streaming. Now there's a third party, you know, both labels and artists are struggling, but there's only investors and fucking Wall Street people are making money from Spotify. Mm. So now that's the next battle to find out. So, but things, things always even out. You know, consumers are by nature uh, as fair as, the, you know, the people who make the product. True. So that's, it's just a matter of time. It's just like a elastic band, you know. Mm. They just take time to, to reconnect, so sort of. and I think in a couple now it's a bit of confusion. People think that the some musicians think that the the record companies are stealing the money from the streaming, which they aren't. The record companies are not sure what's going on because their owners are obviously the one to take the money. Did you know like Spotify is owned? A big part of Spotify is owned by Coca-Cola, mm -hmm. Goldman Sachs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's not the money, not the people you want to oh. put your savings yeah, with. So, you know? so that, that's the next thing. And it's, it's, it's all going to balance out. I, I don't really, for me it's all format. Yeah. You know, a, a digital file is the same as an LP or CD. It's just that I prefer the LP. Yeah. But I have no problem with someone preferring the MP3. It's just we have to find a, a solution sure. where we can agree. Okay, yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah, personally, I, I also prefer the physical thing because when paying for an MP3, I just feel like I'm buying an art. <laughs> yeah, it's nothing. Yeah. It's like a rental, you know? Yeah. But uh, talking of Spotify, I mean, have you seen like any uh, royalties that you received from that as a band? For the band or? No, it's there, and it's sometimes I, I, you know, because I, I'm, I like mathematics and I enjoy myself working out how much I made from one streaming. <laughs> Just it's almost like being one of those auth autistic people trying to figure out the number p, pi, you know, because it's so small. There's so many fucking zeros before you get to a number. So maybe like a thousand streams, I would get maybe ten euro cents or something like that. And it's uh, but it's it's a difference. There's more streaming services coming up. And there's a big difference, you know. So for me, I don't. I love streaming. I hate Spotify. You know, it's a, there's differences within every term. So I would say that to the consumers, or listeners uh, watching this, if you want to make a difference, just subscribe to something else. Just go away from Spotify and go to Wimp or whatever. Mm -hmm. Or by the city. Or by the city. <laughs> I respect people who like streaming, of course. Yeah, of course yeah. No problem. Yeah. But, um, okay, uh, so yeah, returning to your, uh, you mentioned you just came back from America, you toured with the Yob, mm. uh, so how, how, was, how did that tour go? How, how Fantastic, just the first thing there, you, know, you mentioned touring with the Yob, used to go out there every night and watch their set, and because it's one of my absolute favorite bands, and getting to know those guys was just a privilege, beyond everything, and, and then on the business side, we never had such a good turnout before in the US. So many good shows, big shows. I think the, the new album probably pushed it. Because yeah. the reaction to it was, was huge, seriously. Yeah, it really helped. Yeah. It's an amazing album. Thank you. <laughs> so it's one of the most fun months we've had, I think. It's just, every night is just good. Awesome. Um, and so, yeah, we, met, we talked, you mentioned the album. So, uh, what, what do you think of them uh, musically and how did you get along with them as well? It was fantastic. It was one of the favorite bands before we left on the tour, just from, from albums, especially the new one. Clearing the Path to Ascension, it's fantastic. And then we saw them live and it's like, whoa, three guys can make that heavy sound. It's fantastic. <laughs> and just the guys also, it, it was ridiculous. We, you know, Gutle knew the singer, Mike Scheidt, from before, but with, with the band, can you imagine just like two or three hours into the tour and everybody's like best friends because nice. we we connected on that on that level of just loving what we're doing mm -hmm. and having been in the in the scene for such a long time yeah and it was, it was great at last normally we do like funny stuff the last night but for the last two weeks, every night, the guys from Yob will be on stage singing Lisa with us because we just wanted to do something together. And I guess we're going to do that in the future. I've talked to Mike about doing it, just to get a project going and make something together because there's such a common philosophy both on music and you know, life in general. Okay, that must, that must be a cool, really cool feeling. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. You know. You go around for 24 years and then you go on tour with the band you never met before and two hours into the tour you're like, you gotta start a band. <laughs> awesome. I mean, yeah, so yeah, you mentioned that uh, you, you, you performed with ESA together with them and uh, so have you had any other memorable events, incidents during that tour? Or too yeah. many to, <laughs> to pick? Yeah, there's too many. It was like every day was just uh, amazing. Grutle did a song with them in the last show in Boston mm. and, and that was sort of an outer-worldly experience. To see someone from the Slayer singing with the Orb and, and <laughs> just raising the bar is fantastic. Yeah. Awesome. So, I mean, how does touring Europe to North America differ? Was, was the, is there a major difference to it? No, no not really. It's, it's sort of the same basic concept, I guess. With the US, it's sort of 
for us European bands, it has sort of an exotic feel to it. So it, it. It sort of makes you feel a little bit more away from home, and maybe maybe gives you more an impression of things being more intense. But I think that that can be ascribed mostly to to that feeling of, of being somewhere else. It's, it's pretty much the same these days. I guess it's it's because it's global. So the enslaved fans, whatever, have the same kind of perception of the, of the band. Alright. Do you think that probably the internet has has a kind of brings the people closer together? So it kind of makes it be look similar. It doesn't matter where you go anymore. Or, yeah. yeah, I think that has a big. Rest Would it have been different uh, if you went there in the nineties compared to now? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I think the 90s things were like each territory was, was a lot more different. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Um, so, yeah, in September you will be co headlining um, the UK with Grand Magus. Yes. And uh, are you looking forward to that? Absolutely. Yeah. It's a band that's, you know, it's quite different. It's uh, talking about the odd, you know, the Grand Magus is on the other end of the heavy yeah. metal spectrum. I like, really like different them. bands. Yeah. <laughs> I really like them too, and they're awesome people, so I can't wait to, to do that. Very excited to see how, how that package is going to be received in the UK. Mm. Yeah, it should be interesting. I hope to see you there. Yes, <laughs> hope you come. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, what is uh, touring the UK like for you? Is, is, there, is it anything special for you? or? Uh... Yeah, UK is, I guess it's quite similar to the west side of Norway. For some weird reason I have this perception. Really? That, yeah, it's the same kind of mood, the same kind of... You know, there's a there's a distance in the sense like the tongue in cheek thing. Things are not taken too seriously. So I guess also the fact that we worship every kind of like British humor or whatever. That's the basic of a lot of our life philosophy, Monty Python and so on. <laughs> um, that just it connects in a way. So things are not taken too seriously, but at the same time, same time it's very serious. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's a similarity that, that really connects. Yeah, yeah, I think I yeah. can I agree with you. I can, I can see that you know, since I live in the UK. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, okay, so um, what is the future of Enslaved? What, what are your plans for for the future? I mean, you've got the tour in September. Uh, what are you doing after Inferno? We're doing a bunch of summer festivals. Uh, we're doing like uh, scattered festivals here and there up till July. That's when the heavy season starts, and then yeah. it's going to be uh, really a lot of festivals. Then we do UK, then we're doing Norway, October, then we do mainland Europe in November, and then it's either Australia or South America first, one or the other, but both of those are happening. And then I guess it's 2016, and probably back to the US again. All right. Awesome. Groundhog Day all over again. Circle. Yes. <laughs> B busy, busy, busy. Yeah, and then my daughter was two years and three years, and all of a sudden she's 20 and now too old. Who knows? <laughs> well, okay, well, uh, thanks for, for your time. Thanks for meeting you, man. Good yeah. luck with the show, and I hope you enjoy your, your daughter, daughter's birthday tomorrow. All right. <laughs> all right. Thanks a lot. Facing fear, facing birth, the emptiness, the